class. This is Carolyn Holland here with your with Carolyn's Bible class. Um, so we've been visiting with Moses in the book of Exodus, and we've had some interesting um, happenings last week. People got in really big trouble, and we're going to find out what happens next. But let's go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for your love and your care. Thank you for the cooler weather that you've granted us. And now, Father, I pray that you'd give us um, hearts to understand and minds that are open to receive from you, from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so last week in chapter 32, we found out that the children of Israel had behaved very badly. And um, Moses had thrown down the Ten Commandments and God was very angry with them. And so, and there was a, a plague, 3,000 died that day, and um, it was very sad. What I forgot to tell you, that I wanted to tell you, was that a um, 1,000, maybe 1,500 years later, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were added to the church, that were added to the assembly of, of Jesus Christ, the, the Lord's church. So on this day, when the law was given, 3,000 people died because of rebellion. But on that day, 3,000 people came to the Lord. So that was pretty cool. Uh, um, so, but now um, we've come to chapter 33, and uh, we knew that, that Moses had interceded for the people. We talked about that last week, that even though they had been very bad, and even though God had offered to, just, to wipe all those people out and make Moses the head of his nation, um, Moses had said, no, I don't want to, you to do that. I want you to forgive the people and go with us. And he interceded. Let's look at chapter 33. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt to the land, which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will, I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So, um, God's saying, I'll send my angel, and, and that uh, angel with a capital A in the scriptures refers to a pre-incarnate Jesus. So, that's Yeshua. Um, before he was born um, as a human being. Um, this is, so he's saying he'll send, send him with him, but he's not going to go because um, he cannot be with the people, that he would just consume them. And though people heard the bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. And it says, For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped off their ornaments. So they had jewelry. They had all kinds of fancy things that they had taken from the Egyptians. And they, they took it all off. And, and because they were, they, they were sorry. So this was a demonstration of their repentance. They took all their, all their pretty things off, all the, all the extra ornaments. They took them all off. And as a demonstration that they were repentant and they were sorry that they had um, disobeyed God and broken the covenant. And so in their, in their humility of removing um, all of their ornaments, and, and then they just waited to see what God would do. He told them they were stiff-necked people. What that means is they're stubborn and rebellious and that they don't care anything about being obedient to him. So then after that, Moses went and pitched a tent. So here you see this tent that I have set up here. And um, Moses went out there and it says, um, verse 7, Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So any of the people the regular people of the children of Israel, if they decided they wanted to pray or they wanted to ask God to, for help with something, they had to leave the campsite and go outside the camp. So Moses was outside the camp. Um, 
So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. So Moses would be coming out like this towards the tabernacle of meeting and all the people would stand up and they would watch him go in with respect. Um, and then it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Okay, so Moses would be out there at the tabernacle or inside the tabernacle and God would come down in the pillar of cloud and he would stand right there in front of Moses and they would talk. Leo will stand up there. He would... God would talk to Moses and Moses would talk to God and they'd have a lovely conversation. It says all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshiped each man in his tent door. So, you know, they had gotten to know God as more powerful than any of the gods in Egypt. They had gotten to know that he was more powerful than the, the storm God Baal when he opened part of the Red Sea and they came across he found they found out that he was a god that provided for their needs when and he when he healed the the bitter waters and when he provided manna for them and when he brought water from the rock they found out that he was Jehovah Nisi their banner that he would fight for them when he delivered them from um, the Amalekites that attacked them on the way and he god had been patiently explaining to them the tenets of the the covenant the, the Ten Commandments and what he expected of them and to keep the Sabbath and to to um, keep themselves pure and to not uh, follow the the practices of the of the people that that already lived in the land and that they were not to worship other gods God had patiently explained it all to them they had agreed into covenant and they had broken the covenant and then there was uh, a really high price to pay when 3,000 people died. And then it says the Lord plagued the people. So we don't know what else that was, whether it was another sickness in addition to that. We don't know what it was that God plagued the people. But now the people are like, okay, this God, this almighty God, he means business. He's not playing around. Yes, he fought against our enemies. And yes, he provided everything. But he is not pleased when we violate the covenant. We, we need to keep coming in. So at this time, they're very much in awe. And they're, whenever they see that, they stand there and they worship God. And they're like, oh, we worship you. And, and they're in reverence and in awe. And Moses is talking to God. So verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So Joshua, this is only about the second time, or I think the third time that we've heard about Joshua. Um, we heard about Joshua. Um, he was the general that led the army in the fight against the Amalekites. Then we heard that he went up the mountain with Moses, that he was Moses' assistant. And now we find out that he's a young man and that he would go to the tabernacle and he actually stayed in the tabernacle when um, the pillar lifted and Moses would go back to, to his camp, would go back to the people. Joshua stayed right here at the tabernacle of meeting. It doesn't say what he did. It just says he did not depart from the tabernacle. We don't know if he kept it clean, if he spent a lot of time praying. But I want to think about Joshua today uh, just a little bit. He obviously loved God and he wanted to serve Moses. Other than being Moses' sidekick, it does, he doesn't seem to do an awful lot. But we'll see that Yahweh rewards his faithfulness later on. In fact, let's take a little peek in Joshua chapter 1. This is jumping ahead 40 years. Not quite 40 years, but just about 40 years. And now Moses has died. And now Joshua, now there's no leader. And look what God says to Joshua. 
Now God's speaking to Joshua. We don't know if he ever spoke to him before. There's no record of it. There's no writing that God spoke to it. But Joshua kept on seeking a relationship with God. He spent time in God's presence. He spent time in the tabernacle. It says in Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, So now Moses is gone. Let's take Moses. Well, he's not gone, but in this place in Joshua, he is. So we're looking forward. Um, and, and, and God talks to Joshua and he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, rise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people. And he gives him instructions about taking the people into the promised land. And then he says, no, verse 5, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of a good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance. And verse 7, Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so for, for nearly 40 years, Joshua is helping Moses. Moses is the main guy. Moses is the one that God talks to. Moses talks to God. Moses directs the people. Moses this, Moses that. And he's just kind of following along, doing whatever Moses asks him to do, hanging out in the tabernacle with God. And now, in the crucial time, Joshua is the one that is picked to be the next leader. Do you suppose that would have happened had Joshua just been hanging out with his buddies and, and doing everything like everybody else did? Probably not. God would have picked somebody else. But God had laid it on, on Joshua's heart to um, assist Moses and to be there with him no matter what. Um, are you faithful in your relationship to God? You know, sometimes nothing seems to be happening. You may read your Bible every day and, oh yeah, that's interesting. And maybe you mark a few things. You pray and ask God to help you with this or that. And and, and he seems to help you now and then, but you don't see anything really strong. But you know what? Be faithful to God because he, he just said, don't let the word of God depart out of your mouth. Meditate on it. Spend time with it. Stay true to it. And so, and so it's true with us. We need to be faithful to God's word, faithful to God's house, to whatever service God has appointed you. It may be, you know, there was a time that I helped my friend who was the um, the youth pastor at a church that I attended. And I was her right hand. Whatever she needed done, I did. And I was there. And um, God used that time to pull me out of my shell because I was very shy. And so God gave me a, a friend that was was outgoing and strong and and then also she had a ministry. And so there I was assisting her in her ministry. And then, you know, over time, God's given me my own ministry. So wherever you are, whether you're a young person still at home, maybe your ministry is to serve your parents by helping with younger brothers or sisters. Maybe if you're still a student, maybe it's to help and encourage your teachers and to be obedient and, and do what you're said. Maybe you have a job and you're, and, and your job is to be obedient to your bosses and to be helpful to your bosses. That I did that too. I was helpful to my bosses as a, as a teacher, to my principals. So what, or in, in your church, maybe um, in your church, you're, you're in a position to support and encourage your pastor, your Sunday school teacher, your leaders. That's what you should be doing. Be faithful in that ministry and draw close to God because in due time, God will elevate you to another place said so jesus said in luke sixteen ten. luke sixteen ten. he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much 
He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So the idea is being faithful in little things, in being honest in little things. And, and so that you will be, that demonstrates that if you can be faithful with small things, that you'll also be faithful in larger things. Jesus is the one that said that. Jesus also said in Luke 19, 17, And he said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. So in the kingdom of God, when God gives us small things, if we're faithful in that, to be obedient to God's word and to what God has called us to, then he will give us more responsibility later on. And we see that with Joshua. Okay, so we know, we know that Joshua is there. Um, let's go now to verse 12, Exodus chapter 33, verse 12. And let's go back to Joshua being in the, in the tent of Tabernacle. And we'll bring Moses back and we'll bring the pillar. And God manifested himself in this pillar of cloud. Okay, now... Now remember, this is down on, in the foothills in front of the mountain. This is not on the mountain, but God is visiting him here. So verse 12, it says, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you, that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. You now Moses is talking to God and he could have asked him anything, but what did he ask for? He says, now if it's really true that I found grace in your sight, if it's really true that you love me, if it's really true that, that we have this relationship and, and you, you care for me like you said, then this is what I want. He says, I want um, to, I, he says, show me your way. Now, why does, why does, now Moses has already been given the commandments and the law, and yet again he says to the Lord, show me your way, Lord. So he wants to know more. He wants to go deeper into the things of God. Show me your way, and why does he want to know God's way? Number one, he wants to know him. He's not saying, show me your way so I can preach a better sermon. Or show me your way so I can teach a Sunday school class. Or show me your way so I can do well in school. Or show me your way so I can find the right girlfriend or boyfriend or find the right job. He's saying, show me your way that I may know you. That was his priority, to know God. And he says, and that I might find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. He wanted to know God's way so that he could know God better. And so that he would find grace in his sight and he wanted God to consider all of these rebellious people, all this nation, his people. That was Moses' prayer. Wow. You know, a lot of times when we pray, we're praying for things that are beneficial and good for us. And we're not thinking about knowing God better or we're not thinking about um, helping others. Or especially not helping people that have acted like enemies. But that's what Moses is praying for. And so listen to what God says. In verse 14, God says, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And so he told Moses, You know what? I will. My presence will be with you. Don't worry about it. Verse 15 and 16, Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So Moses is saying to God, you know what? You have to go with us. Your presence has to go with us because if you don't go with us and we're traveling on our own, bumbling about in our own way, how will the nations around us know that you're the one that's guiding us? How will it be obvious? You have to go with us. And it says, so we shall be separate. Your people and I from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So Moses recognizes that Yahweh God has chosen him and this vast group of people, the Israelites, to be his special people. 
And because of that, they have to be separate from all the other nations around them. And they have a special calling. They have different laws. They're worshiping the one true God, Yahweh. And, and, and they have all this special covenant. And then Moses said, how is anybody going to know? If, unless you go with us, how will, how will the nations know? And, and the same is true with us. How will people know that, that Jesus Christ is number one in our lives if, if his presence isn't with us, if the Holy Spirit isn't with us? And he says, we shall be separate from all the people on the earth. And, and so that's some, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. And Yahweh answers him, I will, I will also do this thing that you've spoken for. You have found grace in my sight and I know you by name. Wow. He's Moses says, I want to know you, Lord. I want to know everything there is to know about you. And, and I want you to go with us so that we can be separate. And so everybody can see that that we are your people and, and Lord says, okay, I'll do this too. I'll go with you. You have found grace in my sight and I know you by name. I know who you really are, Moses. I know you from the inside out. I know you by name. And God says that to you too, brother and sister in Christ. Each and every one of us that, that has received Jesus Christ as our savior, God knows us by name. It says in in Psalm 139, that he knit us together in our mother's wombs. He knows us. He knows what makes us tick. He knows us from the inside out, and he knows our name. And then look what um, Moses says. Please show me your glory. He doesn't say, give me a better tent. He doesn't say, make the people obey. He says, show me your glory. And we'll see how God shows him his glory next week. But I, Moses set an example. He set an example for Joshua. He set an example for us. The bottom line is that Moses wanted to know Yahweh, to really know him, not just know about him. You know, as I'm teaching you these lessons, I'm teaching you about God. When you read the scripture or when you listen to your pastor, you're learning about him. But you need to press in and pray and talk to him and read the Bible and ask him to speak to you so that you can really know him. Knowing about him and knowing him are two very different things. You know about President Trump. What you know about him depends on what news broadcast you, you listen to. But you know about him. None of us actually knows him. Well, you know, I don't know who all is going to hear this video or watch this video sometime in the future. Maybe somebody that listens to it actually has met the man. I have never met him. I've heard a lot of wonderful things about him. And I've heard people complain about him, but I don't know him. I pray for him because um, God has told us to pray for our leaders. And I do pray for him, but I don't know him. Not like I know my best friend and not like I know God. And, and I'm, I am desiring to know God better. And that, that's my goal is to know God better. And I hope that it's yours. He interceded for his nation and he said, God, I want you to be with us. I want it to be obvious that you are our God and that we will be separate. And there's another scripture that he says, come out from among them and be separate. And I want to just show you that, that scripture in second Corinthians. Um, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church and uh, the, the Christians. And he says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? This is 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 18. For you are the temple of the living God. So if, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you and I are temples of the living God. He lives inside of us, just like he lived inside the tabernacle that we'll study later on back then but now we are the temple so his holy spirit lives in us if we've received him as our savior if we've not received him as our savior then we are not his temple we will be so if you have not received him as savior and lord i pray that you will do that today but let's go ahead and see what else god says about us that are his temples as god has said okay this is god talking and paul is quoting god he says i will dwell in them and walk among them 
See, that's what God told um, uh, Moses, that he would walk with them, he would be with them. He says, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God wants to be our God. He wants us to be his people. And there's so many blessings to being obedient to him because he loves us. You know, there are all the other little G gods that are actually just fallen angels and, and fallen principalities and demon, demonic spirits. They, they don't love you. They hate you. They want to destroy you. And so they, they demand that you do this and they demand that you do that. And the more you listen to them, the more they demand that you do degrading things, that you do stuff that leads to addiction. And, and they're just binding you in chains. But when you come to Yahweh, Jesus paid the price for every sin and every addiction and every bondage so that you could be free. And in freedom, you can serve him. And so he says, I want to be their God and they shall be my people. And now because of this, he says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. So um, he if we are God's people, we need to come out from among them. Does that mean and we need to be separate? Does it mean that we're going to go be a hermit on top of a mountain somewhere or go join a convent? No, that's not what he's talking about. But we are to be separate in the in our ways, in our traditions, in um, the way we do things. So as a believer, when you sit down for a meal, do you bow your head and thank God for that meal? When you do that, you're being separate because other people don't do that. They just dive right in and eat. They don't stop to thank God for their meal. Some people thank God for their meals afterwards. But do you, in some way, stop and thank God for your meal? It says, do not touch what is unclean. So the things that God has, has declared to be unclean, have you gotten those things out of your lives? That's what he's saying. He says, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So part of, of being God's child is being separate from the world. And that's what Moses was saying. So um, are, are, are our prayers about knowing him? Are we separate from the world? Both of these men, Joshua, Moses and Joshua, maintain themselves apart from the rest of the people to be close to God. Okay, that's what they did. That's why Joshua spent time out in the tabernacle. And that's why Moses came to talk to God out here. Back in that time, uh, they had to come to a certain place or come to a certain pe person to have communication with God because Jesus had not died. Excuse me. Jesus had not died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead and gone up to heaven to be with the Father. Once he did that, um, on the day of Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in each and every believer. Actually, before he rose, he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came with power and it dwelt in each believer. And from that day until this, we don't have to go to a temple or talk to a cloud or go talk to a person to pray for us. We can, each one of us, have direct contact with God. Okay. And so we can be separate from other people even while we're in the middle of the people. So let's look at Jesus' prayer. Jesus prayed for his disciples something similar. Let's go to John, book of John in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 17. Oops, I went right past it. John chapter 17. This, this chapter is the prayer. This is truly the Lord's Prayer. This is the prayer that Jesus Christ prayed for his disciples. And let's look. Um, um, well, I'm going to touch on, start in verse 6 and going up to 20. I'm not going to read every single verse, but I want you to hear Jesus' heart. He says, I have manifest, he's praying to his father about his disciples. I have manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. 
They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you've given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you've given to me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So he's saying, Father, the, I, these men that you gave me for disciples, I have kept them, I've taught them, they know who I am. They know who you are and they desire to, to serve you. Then he says in verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Okay, so Jesus didn't pray at, for the world, the people that had rejected him. He didn't pray for those that didn't know him yet. He prayed for the, the disciples that knew him. That's who he's praying for. For those you have given me, for they are yours. And he, he says, all mine are yours and yours are mine. I'm glorified in them. And then he, he's asking, he says, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. So he was praying that the Father would keep safe those, um, the men, that, the disciples, the people that were following him, his followers. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I've kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So there were 12 disciples. And the only one that was lost was Judas that betrayed him. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy. So he wants his people to have his joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So if as we draw closer and closer to God and get to know him better, and serve him more and his love and his word is in us people in the world are either going to come to us because they want to know God and if they have no desire for God they're going to shun us they're going to push us away they're going to reject us just like they rejected Jesus and then look at this verse verse 15 this is the crux he says I do not pray that you should take them out of the world see he's not saying by being separate, he's not saying for us to go hole up in a house somewhere and be holy before God. No, he wants us to be the light of the world. He says, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So Jesus is praying that, that, the, that the Father would keep the believers, us, from the evil one. That he would protect us from attacks of the devil. That we would be able to stay clean in this world. That we would be able to say no to the temptations of a live for him. And that's that's the bottom line of our lesson today. Is that we would desire to know him. Desire to spend time with him. Whether you're in um, a time of your relationship with God. Where, where um, you hear from him regularly. And God is working miracles through you. Or whether you're in the stage like Joshua. Where you're helping and praying and spending time with God. So God is in control regardless. And that is what he desires from us today. To press into him that we desire to know him. And that we know that God is watching out for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we've had together in your word. We thank you that we can know you. That you desire a relationship with us. And that you will keep us as we seek to know you. I thank you for it, and I pray that you bless all those that are listening um, to this lesson today, that they would um, draw close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have a nice week. Goodbye.